Hello, everybody. My name is David Ivey. I am the student pastor here, and I am just honored that I can talk to you today uh, about some of just, I think, something that we all strive for and want to strive for is rhythm in life. Before we get there, um, this past July marked the 16th year of anniversary of being an active minister here at Polaris. And it's one of those things where, like, Marcus and I both started here at the same time, so this is both our 16th anniversary. Uh, and, you know, Alex had said something about longevity and ministry back when we had celebrated his big anniversary a couple months ago. And there's just something special about having ministers here longer than normal. And, and normal for a youth pastor and normal for a worship pastor is three years. And for the fact that we've you know been here as long as we have, it's just a blessing. It's it's really a testament to the leadership here at Polaris, a testament to um, how amazing you guys are as well, and 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 just how awesome God is, and how amazing He's been, the amazing work He's been doing at Polaris. And really, a part of that comes from us having an active, just rhythm in our own lives. And we're about to start a new se- new season, as in a new season of the weather, as we, have, we are in August, and August brings about a couple of great things. First off, I love August weather. It's, to me, it's hoodie and shorts. I can wear that all day, every day, if it was possible. That, believe it or not, there will be colder weather to come, and that means also the, the leaves are going to start changing. Reagan Parkway in Medina, is, I drive out a lot. This one of the first trees I always notice that change. They're already starting to change. Uh, and believe it or not, that means that the pumpkin season is almost upon us. I don't drink pumpkin anything. My wife loves pumpkin coffee. I'm sure some of our, our, our ladies and maybe some of the guys like uh, pumpkin. If you are a guy like pumpkin, we can talk about that later. Um, <clears throat> The most important thing that happens in August is the beginning of football. We, I love football. I played football for 10 years myself. Uh, it's neat driving through, you know, Brunswick, Medina, the area, and just seeing the, the high school kids starting to get back in their pads and starting to play their, their first games, I think, high school first games in like two weeks. Um, you know, the Buckeyes, we'll see if Brian Day can figure out the state up north. I uh, hope so. And hope springs eternal in Berea. We'll find out. Uh, but on top of all that, school begins in a couple weeks. And I hear they're weeping and gnashing of teeth. Our, and the students can't stand when I tell them. I do this thing. I troll our, our students pretty hard. Um, around like May 15th, I say, hey, guys, school's almost out, which means school's about to start. And, and so I just kind of bust their chops throughout the summer, and they hate me for it, but they love me for it. Uh, I have an 11 year old son. His name's Liam. He's going into middle school, uh, and so it's a, it's a weird kind of transition for him. Uh, he's you know excited, also worried. Doesn't help that I tell him about you know kids getting swirlies and wedgies, and and you know and he's like, well, Dad, did you? I go, no, I'm the one who gave him, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but all jokes aside, a, a new season. Uh, brings about all kinds of things. And uh, whether you have kids or not, this time of year, when we start to get back into that rhythm of life, we go from a summer season where it's like, you know, we have vacations, a little more laid back, and all of a sudden we feel like we're drinking water out of a fire hose. There, there's places to be, there's, there's events to get to, there's, there's life to live, and uh, next thing you know, you have, to, you have a soccer game in, in Cleveland, and you also have another kid with a, with a baseball game in, in Wadsworth, and you've got to figure out how to do two places at once. You have, you have you know, school schedules, which means back to doing studies and getting kids up early. You, life just gets more complicated, even though it is the best time of year in Northeast Ohio. But I'm a believer that if we face a new season, whatever it may be, rhythm is important. A rhythm to our lives, our schedules, and our faiths. I have this little pendulum here that um, I I find these neat uh, because they say a lot of things, even though they don't really say anything at all. You have a a lot happening. In in one way, you have the, the... the, the sound, the rhythmic beat 
of everything hitting each other. On the other thing, it's truly chaos. Like, I mean, one thing is colliding with another, which collides with another. It's all kinds of energy here. And, and to me, this is a great, exam, a great visual aid of showing what life is like with rhythm. When you have a rhythm in life, there may be chaos, but there still is something there that's holding you together. And over the next couple of minutes, I hope to share with you some of this biblical ideas that help you have a better rhythm, regardless of what season you are in, regardless if you have kids or not, that we all could use that kind of rhythm. So um, for many of us, we think that if we can just plan our lives to a good extent, that we will have that rhythm and happiness. I am married to a beautiful woman named Jacqueline who is a nurse, and she, if she could, she would plan every aspect of her day down to the minute. She is in the midst of her, she's wrapping up her master's program. She actually will be graduating in September from her master's program, which we are super excited for her. My wife and I were two very different students. Uh, my wife, she actually like plans out like two weeks ahead with her scheduling, with her, her education. Back when I, I, I'm not in school anymore, but when I was in school, that, I, you know, I did my best work two hours before it was due. I, I felt the procrastination gave me the inspiration to make me do great things. Uh, and that's not how my wife rolls. And I think it's fine. I kind of find it funny that God put two of us together. Um, but I, I've seen this in, in my wife's life and those who just want to plan everything. Hard to plan everything when life is chaos. And let's be honest, life is chaos. It doesn't take much to wreck anyone's great plans. You get bad medical news, kind of throws all schedules into different durees. You get news about you know, a, a spouse being fired or, or you yourself getting the pink slip. All those plans you have just aren't there anymore. Uh, and this may be a sillier example, but you find out your kid doesn't get on that team. And you had the, the fall plan that you're going to go th these games, you're going to be ready for this. And next thing you know, your kid's broken hearted. But what do we do now? As much as we try to plan our lives, this world will bring us troubles. And when it does, it throws all those plans into chaos. So how do you find rhythm in that? And, and to me, I, I always go back to Scripture. I think Scripture is the, is the key to so much. And we're going to read a couple things this morning, and I hope to give you some guidance in that, because it's helped my life when it comes to finding rhythm in the midst of chaos. And I, I love going to the words of Jesus, uh, because Jesus defines who I am, and, and, and if you're a follower of him, it should define you. And this world tells us that we need to, to rely on the, the things that will bring the world happiness. And because if you bring the world happiness, it'll bring you happiness. And if your, your schedule's based about these things, you'll be fine. Everything will be great. But then Jesus kind of throws a monkey wrench at this life. And Matthew, when he starts his famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, by saying this. Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And what Jesus is saying in here is all the stuff that the world defines as fulfilling, all the things that the world defines as, as those are the, that's good stuff. At the end of the day, it's hollow and leaves you wanting. 
And, and look at the things he say are, are blessing, you know, the meek in spirit, the, uh, the people who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those are so opposite for what we are talked about and told that, are, that brings us rhythm and life in this world. If you ask someone who isn't a follower of Jesus what brings them the best rhythm and peace, they'll tell you having financial security or, or having that next promotion or having that, the, the, the clout or the uh, influence in their neighborhoods. And reality is it's oftentimes when that's their definition of their world and one thing messes up, it leaves them in chaos and they don't feel the blessings of God. They just feel that emptiness. And some of you understand that really well. This world has promised you all kinds of things and you feel empty. But if we're going to get back on a rhythm, the best thing to do is focus on the things that God says will bring you blessings. For some of you, that means to set aside the stuff of this world and focus on what Jesus has for you. For some of you, it, it means saying no so you can say yes. No to the extra schedule so you can say yes to being with your family more. I think the thing about our schedules and about our rhythms is that we are under the delusion that we are in control. Uh, I think we all want control. We all desire to have control in our lives. So we want to make sure that we know what direction we're going. But let's be honest, if as you have gotten older, I'm sure you realize how little control you actually have in this world. In the book of Ecclesiastes, they actually give us a little understanding that this world is about change, that everything does change. Ecclesiastes 3, the writer says this, uh, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to unbrute, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to scatter stone, a time to gather, a time to embrace, and a time to even refrain from embracing a time to search, and a time to give up, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, a time to mend, a time to be silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and even a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. And when we think our world is right where we want it, right where it should be, change happens. And the writers of Ecclesiastes are, are it's everything, everything under the sun. It changes. At any given moment, it's going to be a time for war. Or at every given moment, we get time to mend. Or maybe for some of us, it means a time to gather and, and actually be prepared for something. And yet, oftentimes, we are so focused on all what the world has to offer that we, when the change does happen, it's not good and it really hurts us, and it, make, it makes us wanting, and we don't feel in rhythm, we feel the chaos that comes from this world. And, and I, I'm, not a, I'm not a changed guy, by the way. Like, my wife will tell you, I am not a changed guy. I, uh, I normally like to wear like, cargo shorts. I, I used this example in the SMT on Wednesday, and the, the adults thought it was funny. Um, I wear cargo shorts a lot, and apparently that's not fashionable. Uh, I was told that uh, cargo shorts were back in like 2000 and late, and I'm like, well, you know, the, the, what's, the, what's the, the old saying that men choose their style for life and they're in like they're 19, 20 years old and they'll stay forever. And I, that's true. I have the same haircut and would wear the same clothes. So she tried to buy me like these, these, these like golf shorts and this is weird. I have no places for my stuff. Um, but, you know, my wife wants me to change and be more fashionable. That's fine. I'll hold on to that a little bit. I'll let her... As silly as that is, are you holding on to something that needs to be changed? Are you holding on to something that's just always been status quo and has always bring you comfort, but yet at the same time, it's, it's caused your life to be off rhythm? Uh, there are some things that need to change that aren't necessarily bad. There, there's some, you know, things that need to change, but you, you don't want to at all. So there's a lot of correlation between change and fear. 
Because when you change something, you, you get out of your comfort zone. And that's when you need God's rhythm all the more. Paul tells us this in 1 Timothy 6. He says, Command those who are rich uh, in this present world not to be arrogant nor put their hope in wealth, which is uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And what Paul's saying is, listen, this world presents all kinds of things that they feel is necessary, but they're so uncertain. You are a pink slip away from that certainty. You are a health diagnosis away from that uncertainty. You are a bad news away from that uncertainty. But when we trust in God, God will fulfill us richly for our enjoyment. And then Paul tells us in Philippians, for the rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. And basically Paul's saying, don't rejoice in what the world has to do because the world's going to let you down. Rejoice in the only thing that bring you, can bring you joy, and that's Jesus. When we live in a world that's constantly in chaos, where do we go and what do we do? I love using this as an example because... as calming as that noise can be for some of us. Maybe it's deafening to you, you don't like it. I, I find it calming. As much chaos we see as, as one ball collides with another, this can't happen without the two metal posts. This can't work. This rhythm in life can't be a thing unless you have an anchor. If I remove these two, these two posts, these six, five, six balls would go scattering. There would be no way to control them. There would be no way to bring them back into focus. There would be no way to bring them into a rhythm again because there's nothing anchored to them. We need to be the same way in life. We need something to anchor our lives to. And when we anchor things to the, that are, are perishable, anchor our things that don't last forever, and when that fails us, we are scattered in chaos. But when we are anchored in Jesus and what he stands for, we can have rhythm. But a lot of us are carrying some burdens in our lives. And it's hard to be in rhythm when we are burdened. In Matthew 11, Jesus says this. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I love this visualization that Jesus gives us here. If you don't know what a yoke is, a yoke is a farming tool. It's a huge piece of wood that would put on the shoulders of two massive animals that would actually help plow the fields. That's what a yoke is. It, it, as I tell my son, it's not the egg yoke. It's the, it's the wood yoke. And my young son goes, what's the difference? And I go, well, I don't know, bud. You're, <laughs> you're 11, you'll figure it out. Um, if you've ever tried to hold an actual physical yoke, those things are hundreds of pounds. Uh, I actually, it was neat, when I was in college, my, my college football coach uh, took us to this like farmland, and, and I think the idea was to teach us how to work together, yada, yada, um, you know, coach, coach speak. He had this massive yoke, this, it, it, back when we would use it to plow fields 100 years before. And he had me and a bunch of my large mammal friends uh, to get underneath this yoke to pick it up. Now, not to like, you know, toot my own horn. I'm, I, at one point, I was a pretty strong dude. I, and, I, and as an arrogant young 20-year-old, you think, yeah, I got this. So I said, I don't need your help. And I got underneath the one side of a yoke, which was silly enough as it is, and 
I almost threw my back out picking this thing up. And I remember our, our coach saying, you can't do this by yourself anyways. You need some people in your life to help you. And we, you know, after we get like five, six football players, you can easily lift that thing. But what Jesus says here, and I, and I love what he's, he's visualizing, he's like, listen, think of that heavy burden on your life. I take that from you and replace it with something light. I take that from you so you can move through life with less chaos. I take that from you so that you can have a more rhythmic part to your world. I take that from you so that you can live in peace and in joy and fulfillment. And to me, one of the things that, that has always brought me back into rhythm in life has always been Christ. And yet, oftentimes, we remove our faith walk from our schedules because we're busy. Oftentimes, we say we, we can't make it at church this morning. We, we got football or soccer. We, can, we can't get our kids to a, a, a Polaris event or a Polaris Kids event or SMT because and we got to do this, this, and this, and this. And I, I sit next to or sit across a table with students and look them in their eyes and they tell me how exhausted they are and how, how much anxiety they feel and how much depression uh, falls upon them and, and how much frustration they have with their lives and how busy they are and how they feel they're suffocating under the busyness, how they feel their uh, wave crashing on them constantly. And I always ask them, hey, where, where, where are you at with your faith? Where, where's your anchor? If we are going to get into a rhythm, you have to be anchored in something. And when I am anchored in Jesus, my rhythm, it just flows. But when I anchor my life in anything other, it is chaos. So what do you do with this? What do you do with this information as you go off into a, a beautiful Sunday? Maybe for you, it, it's time to start really focusing on your faith when it comes to your daily rhythm. Getting into scripture, prayer, where's your prayer life? Is it there? Is it, is it, is it a thing? Uh, are, are you focusing any of your life on, on something other uh, than the world? Are, are you actually are finding an anchor? Maybe for you, it, it's time to start saying no to things. This world will fill every minute of your schedule if you allow it. Uh, I have, my son plays hockey, I understand, and he, he, we can fill every day of the week with hockey. But my son would be less than if I did that. I could fill every day of the week with work but my family would be less than if I did that. Sometimes it's okay to say no. Sometimes it's okay to say yes. Say yes, I'm going to stop and have a meal with my family without phones. I know that's sacrilegious to teenagers and young adults. Like sit down and just talk. Say yes to actually getting away with your family for a weekend or a day without any distractions. Say yes, you know, we're going to serve in some way because we need to be anchored in something other than this world. For some of you, it's, it's time to start trusting that God has a plan for your world and plan for your life. One of the, the, the verses I use a lot at funerals when I officiate funerals is the shepherd's, shepherd's psalm. Beautiful psalm. I think a lot of you could probably just... Say it at the top of your head. The Lord is my shepherd. I, shall, I lack nothing. But at the end of the shepherd's song, it says this. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you are not anchored in God's goodness and love, man, it, it's gonna, you're going to feel chaos. If you're not anchored in something that is going to last for all time, there cannot be rhythm. But God has a good plan for your day and your life. You just have to be in rhythm with him.
And as the band comes back up, we're going to play one last worship song this morning. I challenge you to do this. I challenge you to be honest with yourself on what your season to come is going to look like. Is it going to be full of, of, of constant activity? Is it something you need to step back from? Are you out of rhythm with Jesus? And when you start to anchor yourself daily to him, you are going to find that there is a rhythm in life. One that's much more satisfying than anything this world has to offer. Because surely the goodness and love of the God will dwell with us forever when we are anchored in him and his plans for us. Will you pray with me? Father God, we are thankful for your son and we're thankful that you want us to be in rhythm with you. God, there are so many things that pull us away from that anchor, and oftentimes it leaves us in so much uh, chaos and so much wanting for something better. And your promise to us is that we are anchored in you, that we will have that rhythm. And God, I ask you to help us find those ways. God, there, are, there are ways in our lives that we, are, we either have a blind eye to or, or are admit, ready to admit that we're, we're struggling with. But God, I ask you just to allow us to see that so we can be in rhythm, not just in this school season or fall season to come, but for the next week, months, and year to follow. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.